This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. High stakes stocks drop to start the second quarter as investors recalibrate ahead of a flood of potentially market moving events. Tapping the brakes, auto sales slow in March, leading some to wonder if the recent boom is coming to an end. And factory of the future, what some of the biggest companies in the world are doing to bring their workers into the 21st century. Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Monday, April 3rd. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Investors were not in a buying mood on this first day of the second quarter. Stocks were slipping and sliding as some economic data came in weaker than expected. As one Wall Street watcher put it, investors want to see evidence of an improving economy in order to rely less on government policies. Today, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was off 13 points to 20,650. The Nasdaq dropped 17, and the S&P 500 lost three. And a number of key events over the next few days and weeks could determine the direction of stocks. Dominic Chu explains. One quarter down, three more to go in 2017. And one of the biggest questions for investors now is whether the market rally since the election can keep going. While there is a general optimism on Wall Street, many experts feel as though there are reasons to be at least a little bit cautious in the coming weeks and months. To the extent we did not have some sort of corporate tax reform, that certainly would be uh, a difficulty for the markets. If there were anything on the political situation with elections, whether it's upcoming in France or Germany later in the year, that delivered a surprise, that could be an issue. And finally, I'd say the markets, S&P at uh, 20 times earnings, that's the kind of environment that any modest nick can have an outsized impact on where the market goes and where valuations go. You can't really blame people for being a little more conservative with their investments. There's a lot on the agenda to pay attention to this month. On the international front, you've got concerns over the train bombing in Russia, as well as meetings President Trump has with the leaders of Egypt and China this week. Here at home, there's the coming showdown in Congress over the confirmation of Supreme Court Justice nominee Neil Gorsuch, as well as concerns over a possible government shutdown later on this month. And of course, there's a lot of economic data, including a big jobs report and a lot of Fed speak. Now, that being said, some are advising a more disciplined investing approach for individual investors. Well, I think for the individual investors out there, one, you know, pay attention to your 401k statements. I also think that it's really important to, you know, stay the course. Um, you know, most folks cannot be traders. It's better to be investors and focused on the long term and continue to contribute to your retirement savings. According to Bespoke Investment Group, over the past half century, April has been the strongest month for the stock market. But there's a lot on the horizon that could put a dent in that rally. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Dominic Chu. Let's turn now to Michael Jones for more on what the market will focus on and how it all might impact stocks in the days and weeks ahead. He's chairman and chief investment officer at Riverfront Investment Group. Mr. Jones, welcome. Good to have you with us. You say there are sort of three pillars of this rally in stocks that we've seen. Uh, higher earnings, the accelerating global economy, and the progress of the Trump agenda. What happens if one of those three things gets stymied? Well, I think we, we're looking in April at probably that last point on the, uh, the tripod coming under some severe pressure. We should remember that one thing that Trump is doing doesn't need congressional approval, and that's the deregulation push. We saw that with the EPA pronouncements last week. And deregulation is going to continue. The market loves that. But we are going to have a very important series of legislative events. The one that not enough people are talking about is the budget situation, the need for continuing resolutions to avoid a government shutdown, and the need for a debt ceiling increase. All of it's going to be controversial. All of it's going to be hard to pass. And the market's not going to like it. Yeah. And so if you are a longer-term investor, do you just put that, for lack of a better word, noise aside? Or do you try and, and maneuver around it? Well, I think that there are a lot of investors who have been caught on the sideline with this rally since the election. It just feels that way. Even look at today's trading action. You know, we had a big downdraft early in the day, and sure enough, buyers came in. That suggests to us a market that's technically in good shape. There's a lot of people waiting to buy. 
So I think some of the disappointment that we may see on the political front might create a little bit more of a pullback than we've seen thus far. Right now, if we go to down 2%, buyers come running in, we should get a more normal 5% pullback this month. And if I'm an investor that's been frustrated and waiting to buy, I think it's going to be a very good opportunity. So uh, of these events, that's interesting. You point to that uh, sort of end of month debt ceiling matter. And those are the folks he's going to need the folks in the Freedom Caucus, whom he did not negotiate terribly successfully with and then went on to insult uh, later on after that health care vote. Let's turn to trade for just a moment. There was some talk last week that it sounds like some of the rhetoric is softening just a bit there. Is that how you see it? Absolutely. I, I think maybe this is Wilbur Ross's influence. Maybe it's some of the other uh, people that uh, Trump has surrounded himself uh, with since being elected. But there is no question that the NAFTA proposals were much more moderate, much more incremental than the campaign rhetoric might have suggested. And the market really likes that. We, we want to see NAFTA improved, not discarded. And that seems to be the direction that the Trump administration is going. And that sets us up well for Xi's visit this week. Uh, you know, really harsh rhetoric is typically going to uh, prompt a backlash from China just as much as from the Freedom Caucus. And so what we want to see is the right. president take a more moderate tone and the NAFTA proposals seem to be setting the stage for just that kind of successful summit with Xi. And, of course, President Xi and uh, the president uh, will be talking about North Korea, uh, a uh, really potential flashpoint. Thank you very much, Michael Jones with Riverfront Investment Group. To the economy now, where construction spending was not as strong as expected, though it did rebound from the prior month. According to the Commerce Department, construction spending rose 0.8 percent thanks to the warmer weather in February. Manufacturing activity cooled a bit in March, but still remains on an upward track. The sector saw a modest decline in new orders in production, but a gauge of employment in the manufacturing industry hit its highest level since 2011. Auto sales were weaker than expected in March. It may be the latest sign that America's seven-year auto boom could be coming to an end. Fiat Chrysler, General Motors, and Ford were all lower in trading today. Phil Lebeau has more on the auto industry's disappointing month. Make no mistake, Americans are still buying plenty of new vehicles, especially trucks and SUVs. But March shows U.S. auto sales overall continue to slow down. Last month, business was much lower than expected for GM, Toyota, and Fiat Chrysler, while Ford did slightly better than forecasted, but still had negative sales last month. So is the auto market that's been in overdrive finally stalling? Well, it's too early to tell, but the warning lights are definitely flashing. For starters, inventories are rising, so new models are sitting on lots longer. And when they do sell, dealers are spending more to close the deal. Also, there's a glut of used cars and trucks hitting the market, pushing those prices down and making some used models more attractive than some new cars and trucks. With the March sales pace falling under 17 million for the first time since last June, this could be an indication auto sales will not rise for the first time in seven years. But how much sales slow down depends in part on how automakers handle the drop in business. It gets kind of tricky now at this point in the cycle. How aggressive do automakers want to be on incentives? Because you can easily juice volume, and that looks great on sales day every month. But at the end of the day, it's about profits, not market share. That's the challenge. Can automakers remain disciplined and avoid an incentive war that cuts into profit margins? This is a cyclical industry. And historically, automakers have not done well when sales slow down. Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, Chicago. And here's a first. Tesla is speeding past Ford in terms of market cap after delivering a record number of cars for the quarter. In the first three months of the year, Tesla delivered 25,000 cars, while Ford sales dropped 7 percent in March. Tesla now has a market cap of roughly $48 billion. Ford's market cap stands at $45 billion. Well, the Federal Reserve fattened up its balance sheet during the recession and embarked on a bond-buying program in an effort to juice the economy and lower interest rates. As we reported Friday, the president of the New York Fed hinted that it might be time for the central bank to slim down just a bit. But as Steve Leisman reports, it's a tricky thing to do. Not a lot of precedence here, and it could leave investors vulnerable. 
for sale. Trillions of dollars of treasuries and mortgages on the books of the Fed's balance sheet that it doesn't seem to need anymore. Now that the economy seems to be recovered, so much so that the Fed is now raising interest rates, Fed officials now are starting to talk gently about reducing the size of its four and a half trillion dollar balance sheet. There is interest among FOMC members to start to shrink that balance sheet in a gradual and predictable way. Increasing the size of the balance sheet during the financial crisis was an answer to a problem. The Fed had already cut rates to zero, but the economy was still weak. So the Fed purchased trillions of dollars of government bonds and mortgages to drive down interest rates and try to drive up the stock market. Now four times the size of what's normal, the balance sheet is a potential problem in itself. It risks creating more inflation, if not right-sized, for a stronger economy. Let's say they have a five-year plan. They need to get the balance sheet down to about $1.8 trillion. So they need, they need to get about $2.5 trillion off the balance sheet. The plan is fraught with risk. The reason the Fed is raising interest rates before reducing the balance sheet size is it admits it doesn't know how to calibrate a decline in its balance sheet with the effects on interest rates and the economy. We think it's much easier uh, in using that tool uh, to communicate the stance of policy. We have much more experience with it and have a better idea of its impact on the economy. Investors are going to be listening closely. Too aggressive a plan could be a major selling event. So the best guess? The Fed announces a plan this year to gradually reduce the size of the balance sheet and doesn't actually do anything until later this year or early in 2018. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Steve Leisman. Still ahead, check your EpiPens. The recall of the life-saving allergy shot has been extended to the United States. There's an expanded recall of EpiPens, the life-saving allergy medicine. The initial recall was issued last week. It did not include the U.S., but that has changed. And certain EpiPens sold in the United States are also affected. Meg Terrell has details. If you keep an EpiPen on hand for allergy emergencies, check the package for its lot number. Late Friday, the manufacturer of EpiPen expanded a recall of the product to include 13 lots in the United States. This comes after a recall earlier in March of 81,000 units in other countries. The initial recall was due to two reports of the EpiPen failing to activate. In both cases, patients were able to use a backup device on hand, according to Mylan, which sells the EpiPen. The device is manufactured for Mylan by Pfizer. Now, Mylan says testing has turned up no further cases of the potential defect and that the recall is being expanded voluntarily out of an abundance of caution. Mylan says it will replace recall devices at no cost. As for the financial impact, Evercore ISI estimates it may amount to about 3% of U.S. EpiPen sales, or about $21 million. Now, the affected lots include both EpiPen and EpiPen Junior, with expiration dates between April and October of this year. Mylan says the recall doesn't include the authorized generic version of the EpiPen, an identical product it recently introduced in response to an outcry over the price of the branded version. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Meg Terrell. And for more information and to check, check rather which lot numbers are involved in that recall, you can visit our website at nbr.com. Panera might be for sale, and that is where we begin tonight's market focus. Bloomberg News says the restaurant chain has received takeover interest and is looking into so-called strategic options. Although a deal may not happen, potential buyers are said to include Domino's Pizza. A deal between Domino's and Panera would involve a lot of dough. Panera shares rose nearly 8% on the news to 282.63. I had to. Bristol Myers Squibb said two of its cancer drugs, when used together, extended the lives of patients with advanced melanoma. The biotech company said a trial showed the combination of treatments proved to be more effective than when a patient just took one of the medicines. Shares were off a fraction at 54.21. 
Novocure posted positive trial results from its experimental cancer treatment. The company said its treatment, which uses electrical fields to kill cancer cells, improved the overall survival rate in patients newly diagnosed with a common form of brain cancer when the treatment was used in conjunction with chemotherapy. Novocure shares surged 37% to $11.10. And biotech company United Therapeutics said regulatory delays caused it to postpone the launch of its implantable device to treat high blood pressure affecting the lungs and heart. The company now expects the product to launch in 2018. Shares were punished following, the, following that news, falling about 8 percent to 123.96. The government is issuing new guidelines on visas used heavily by tech companies to hire foreign engineering workers. The visa program is called H-1B. The Justice Department and the Department of Homeland Security say they want to make sure the visas are not being misused at the expense of U.S. workers. And as Aditi Roy reports from San Francisco, the filing period starts today. Purma Gupta came to the U.S. from India in 2013. She arrived on a spouse visa with her husband, who was on an H-1B visa. But Purva had her own dream of starting a company. For that, she too needed an H-1B. That was easier said than done. The more difficult part is that it's a lottery, that you, it's a gamble. Last year, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services received more than 236,000 H-1B applications for 85,000 spots. The government has a lottery to select the visa holders. Critics of the system, which include President Trump, argue it favors outsourcing companies that flood the program with applicants to clinch the majority of these visas for cheaper workers. Unfortunately, over time, what's happened is that there's been loopholes in the program uh, that actually uh, allow employers to bring in uh, workers at much lower uh, wage rates than Americans. Howard University professor Ron Hira is an expert on the issue and has testified to Congress about the need for reform. He says another problem with the current system is that there's no requirement for companies to recruit American workers first. And so what's happened is the program's been dominated by uh, employers who are really making pr uh, profits over uh, replacing or substituting for American workers with these H-1B workers. While the Trump administration has signaled it would reform the system, so far no changes have been issued. Tech companies like Google, Microsoft and Amazon rely heavily on immigrant workers. And many in Silicon Valley say these companies could be hurt by changes to the program. Still, some believe some changes are necessary. I'm not convinced that the current um, policy is not only serving the American person, it's also not serving the best immigrant talent either. Manan Mehta is the founder of Unshackled, a venture capital firm that invests in startups by immigrant founders to help them navigate the immigration process. He hopes those who would benefit under a reformed H-1B process would be entrepreneurs, not outsourcing companies. Imagine if the 35,000 of the 85,000 a year that, that go to IT outsourcing companies went to entrepreneurs instead and they created 10 jobs each, Will we be having these discussions today? I don't know if we would. Purva, who's sponsored by Unshackled, says she didn't make the lottery the first time she tried, but she was able to remain in the country through her spouse visa and received her H-1B on her second try. Reggie Fu, another Unshackled entrepreneur, just submitted his H-1B application and worries about what will happen if he doesn't win this lottery. If that happens, I couldn't continue my business here. I've talked to some immigration attorneys while they were preparing applications last week. They say they're handling fewer applications this year, partly because the fees have been getting higher, even under the Obama administration, and also because of uneasiness over the current political climate. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Aditi Roy, San Francisco. Google is trying to figure out how to solve a big issue of its own, monitoring its content. As we've been reporting, some very big advertisers have pulled out of Google's YouTube because they don't want their brands placed next to objectionable videos. Tonight, Julia Borston hears from the advertising industry at a conference in Los Angeles. Chief marketing officers and ad agencies here are talking about what Google has to do for their brands to feel safe on YouTube. What we're hearing from our members is that it's time for a lot of these platforms to grow up. 
Uh, but they're still fairly young platforms. And unlike the other platforms that we've had, television, radio, print, that have been around forever, they haven't really grown up and in, into a place where you can measure and understand what's really being delivered. Taco Bell's chief marketing officer, Marissa Thalberg, tells us that while she considers Google an important partner, they're taking a break until Google makes more changes. We are on pause, however, and that's how we see it because at the end of the day, context matters. Mobile ad company Cargo, which only serves ads with premium content, is benefiting from the Google boycott as companies such as AT&T look to move their digital ad dollars to what's seen as safer content. The world of advertising in general is at this point of change. What we're seeing finally is that marketers are waking up and they're saying, just doing audience targeting at mass scale is not enough for us. We need to be guaranteed that we're going to be running in great brand safe places. The timing of the boycott is powerful ahead of the upfront and new front ad sales period when brands commit a big chunk of their annual ad dollars. The head of marketing giant IPG Michael Roth tells us brands and agencies are using this to push for more transparency. Best way to keep uh, organizations accountable is to do it with your pocketbook. So I think that part of it frankly worked. Roth tells us that some of IPG's clients are starting to come back to Google because Google is pulling out all the stops to show brands it's taking steps to fix this problem. Google tells us, quote, many advertisers never left and many have decided to come back. While they know that no system can be perfect, they appreciate the actions we've taken and know we are taking this seriously and are committed to getting better and better. For a Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston in Los Angeles. Coming up, schools in session, training workers for the manufacturing jobs of the future. UPS is expanding its operations. The world's largest package delivery company will add Saturday ground deliveries to keep up with the increase in online shopping. The expansion will eventually add 6,000 jobs. Rival FedEx already delivers items on that day, and the Postal Service also makes Sunday deliveries in some markets for Amazon.com. The tech industry is expanding along with the number of jobs it's creating. According to a new report, employment in the field grew about 3 percent last year to 7 million workers. Now, most of the gains came from the software, cybersecurity, and cloud computing industries. And the pay in the tech sector more than double the national average at nearly 109000 a year. And according to that same report, it's not just California and New York that are seeing high rates of tech sector employment. Michigan and Pennsylvania are in the top 10. And that's partly because factory floors are going high tech. That modernization means new skills are required to operate that machinery. Morgan Brennan looks at how companies are training workers for the factories of the future. She's in Grove City, Pennsylvania. Technology. The adoption of automation, 3D printing, and digitization is fundamentally transforming factory floors, and with them, job descriptions. Take General Electric. GE's been on the forefront of this trend as it begins to roll out its brilliant factory format, which harnesses sensors, big data, software, and robotics. GE workers at this Grove City, Pennsylvania facility use data to assess locomotive engines like this one that are coming in for repair. That's a process that allows them to target specific parts rather than do full teardowns, which is what used to happen. The shift involves transitioning from paper to the cloud as employees scan barcodes to create a digital thread of a machine, get acquainted with algorithms, and use devices to complete tasks once done by hand. Jamie Miller, GE's transportation chief and an architect behind this new factory model, says it's creating a demand for skills that you may least associate with all this tech. Traditionally, where it may have been, um, you know, how people can do the actual work, that's really been supplemented by, you know, a deeper look at the soft skills, a deeper look at kind of, you know, how they work in a, in a bigger environment. As productivity increases and the manual labor part of the job decreases, workers must become more predictive and interactive, especially since longtime machinists and technicians are being teamed with data analytics experts. To do all of this, GE now plans to retrain 150,000 employees and it's revised its recruitment protocol as well. 
Of 100 recent Grove City applicants, less than 10 passed the screening to make the cut. And GE certainly isn't alone. More companies, including Siemens, Lockheed Martin, and John Deere, are investing in their workforces to retrain longtime employees, but also to develop and attract the next generation, who tend to be more comfortable with tech already. Experts say these opportunities are crucial to bridging the skills gap. Public policy or other employer policies that stimulate that kind of ongoing learning is ultimately going to help this adaptation to the changes in the manufacturing sector. Deloitte has estimated of three and a half million new manufacturing jobs likely to be created by 2025. As many as two million could go unfilled due to the skills mismatch, making training a necessary component for the factories of the future. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Morgan Brennan in Grove City, Pennsylvania. And finally tonight, Ronco Brands, famous for its late night and round the clock commercials selling things like the Vegematic. Well, it's filed to go public. The kitchen gadget maker is looking to raise $30 million through a mini IPO by selling 5 million shares. But wait, there's more! <laughs> <laughs> On Ronco's website, the company is offering discounts. For example, buy more than $5,000 in shares and get a one-time discount of 20% off a Ronco product plus a countertop rotisserie worth hundreds of dollars if sold separately. For you, $19.99 plus shipping and handling. I think there's a second career I'm in going there for, for you. You could be the Vegematic <laughs> guy. There you go. Excellent. Well... Wait, there's no more. We've got to say we goodnight. We've got to say goodbye. <laughs> That's Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. I'm Tyler Matheson, plus shipping and handling. <laughs> Have a great evening, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.